in this time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to Lord of Life. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. The, uh, we gather this morning, this first Sunday after Easter, and we remember how the gospel ended last week with the uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, James, or excuse me, uh, Peter and John looking into the empty tomb, realizing that it is empty, and the scripture tells us in Matthew 28, verse 8, that they ran, and they, they, they ran with um, joy, great joy and fear. Stop and think about that for a minute. Great joy and fear. It almost seems like two opposite ends of the uh, emotion spectrum, yet the scripture tells us that's what they experienced. What does that mean? And what does that mean for us today? <clears throat> that's our focus as we gather to worship. Let us continue with our prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. And now let us continue this morning's worship by confessing our sins and seeking God's forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault, in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. And I ask mercy and forgiveness from our loving God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let us share this peace with one another. <clears throat> and now our uh, worship will continue with the reading of the focus lesson. <clears throat> Our focus uh, lesson for today is from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, can never spoil, can never fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith 
are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of even greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here ends the reading. Our gospel for this morning is from John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, then I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his holy name. Here ends the reading. Our epistle uh, lesson is from 1 Peter. Um, this uh, lesson is one that, that speaks to us in wonderful terms about joy. And it tells us that joy is a command. It's a command from Jesus. And it is something that is lasting. Joy, you see, is different from other emotions that we experience because joy is, is a, um, an attitude. Joy is something that is like living life with great expectation. Joy is future-focused. Where, for example, you say, well, is happiness and joy the same thing? No, they're not. Not in the Bible. Happiness is something that's more based on circumstances, something that has happened. For example, um, you're playing a, a specific sport, be it uh, golf or, or football or baseball, and you have a great comeback victory. You feel a sense of sheer happiness, and, and you're excited and you're happy and you're celebrating that particular moment because you won. Joy is something, on the other hand, that endures. Joy is, is a feeling of the heart and the very soul that, that is with you even in difficult times. Joy is something that is uh, with us each and every day because it is future-focused. Joy is telling us that, that um, we have an, an outlook on life that is focused on Christ, that is focused on, e on heaven, our eternal life. And that's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are you who have not seen and yet you believe. Joy, living in joy, it means that we are future 
focused, even though we're going through the present time of trials and struggles. It's interesting that in the gospel today, we hear that the, the disciples ran back and they told the other disciples what had happened, that the tomb was empty, but they didn't fully understand what that meant. And what they did was they locked themselves up in a room called the upper room. This was the place that they celebrated the Last Supper in with Jesus on the Thursday night, the night before his very own death on Good Friday. This was the last place that they were with the Lord when they received the body and blood of Jesus. And they were starting to come to grips and to understand a little bit what this all means. It was all so different and so new to them. But Jesus wants to make sure they understand what has happened, and so he appears to them. Even though they're locked up in a room for fear of going outside, for fear of their own lives, Jesus appears in their midst. And Jesus says, the, the scripture says to us that Jesus said, my peace be with you, and he breathed upon them the power of the Holy Spirit. And they began to be excited again and filled with this joy of the resurrection, and they were able to start to move forward in life. But it's interesting, when they went to tell Thomas, Thomas was not with them at that time in the upper room. Thomas did not believe. There always seems to be, be one person in, in a bunch, that's, that's human nature, I guess, that it is a little more negative or a little bit more wanting more evidence or more uh, understanding before they come to believe. And that happened to be Thomas in this instance. So Thomas says straight out, unless I see the nail marks that, that they had put in his hands, unless I put my hand in his side where the soldier put the spear up uh, to make sure that he was dead, until I see these things and do these things, I'm not going to believe. Scripture tells us uh, in today's text that Jesus comes back a second time. And you know the interesting thing is, Thomas is called Doubting Thomas, and we always remember that, uh, and he's doubting because he doesn't believe. And that uh, particular uh, moniker has stayed uh, with that name Thomas uh, till this day, some 2,000 years later. But here they come again. Now they're still locked away in the upper room. What about the other disciples who supposedly believed and know all this? Why were they still locked up? Why were they still, you could say, in fear? Jesus comes to them, and he comes specifically to Thomas. He said, touch the nail marks in my hands. Touch my side that you would come to believe. And Thomas gives that wonderful acclamation that none of the others do. He says, my Lord and my God, he comes to believe. And then what a difference that makes in all of their lives. The disciples would become empowered. They would finally receive that joy, that feeling of joy, that, that outlook, the world outlook of a joyous outlook of the resurrection in all they do and in all they, they have said and do and in all they've acted. They left that upper room. They left the locked-in confines. And it's interesting, it's very interesting that we find ourselves today in our world pretty much doing the same things the disciples were. We're locked in our homes. We stay in our homes for fear of death, for fear of exposure to this coronavirus. So were they. They thought that the Roman soldiers were going to come and get them, and they were going to crucify them for their beliefs, just like the soldiers did to Jesus. So today, as we read these texts, we can kind of feel what they might have been feeling at that same time, for we're doing it ourselves. You know, it's interesting, uh, the scripture or the uh, epistle lesson today from Peter tells us that we live in this joy, we live in this uh, future-oriented outlook and this attitude that everything is going to be okay. It's an assurance of that, okay? We live with joy, all right? Um, but it says to us plainly, we will still experience times of trial and times of hardship in this world, for that is what life is. Sometimes God works through those things to strengthen our faith, to bolster our faith. In uh, <coughs> 1862, the Homestead Act uh, became a law. And the Homestead Act uh, gave settlers, they were trying to populate all the lands west of the Mississippi River. And when that became a law, it attracted many people, many immigrants. And uh, uh, some of those immigrants were my own family members. Uh, they, they migrated here from Sweden. They went as far west as uh, South Dakota. And uh, my great-grandfather, Olaf Pearson, uh, was the one who came first. And, <coughs> excuse me, he, um, he went to a place called South Dakota and he found a, a plot of land 
that was available and that he had water on it and that he liked. And he went back to the assayer's office and he, he put in for that and he was given that land. The first things that they did was they, they, uh, they survived by building sod homes. And they did that, and that's how John Deere became so popular because they were the ones who had this, this very heavy steel uh, plow that was able to roll up the sod, and they would roll up these, these pieces of sod, and they would pile them up, and that would become like a house. So most of the settlers back in the 1870s, 1872 is when my grand, uh, great-grandfather came here, they lived in these sod homes. They were very strong in their faith. <laughs> and uh, they, the first thing that they did, actually, when more and more settlers came out there, was to build a church. And where did they build it? On my great-grandfather's land. They built it on, uh, right on the lake called Lake St. John. It was the first structure that they built out of wood. And in 1900, 1902, I believe, they decided as they were building up a little town called Lake Norton that they were going to move that church into town so it could be a centerpiece. And that's what they did. That church is still standing to this day. And it's interesting, as I go back to South Dakota, there's several <coughs> cemeteries that are around there. And to a person, <coughs> you will see on the gravestones a reference to one particular Bible verse. And that Bible verse is Psalm 23. And it, it's some reference to it. Either it'll say Psalm 23 or it'll say the Lord is my shepherd. But there is a particular verse in there that gives me great strength. And it's one I think that speaks to us to this day. And that particular verse is, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. It doesn't mean the valley is going to be any shorter. It doesn't mean the valley is going to be any easier. It's still a time of struggle, still a time of challenge. But we find comfort and peace in knowing that God is with us. That's what my great-grandparents felt. And that's what, what spurred on all of those early pioneers to continue to put one foot in front of the other. They had such belief, such hope. You might say absolutely that they lived in the joyful expectation of knowing that heaven awaits them, of knowing that no matter what the, the struggle that they're going to endure and go through, that God is with them. And they find that sense of peace and hope through that, and they're going to get through that. That's the way that I grew up with my brothers. My brothers and I grew up in northwest Detroit, uh, basically a, a blue-collar uh, neighborhood. Um, and uh, it was a, a difficult neighborhood. My dad was uh, a worker. Uh, he was a millwright at Detroit Diesel. And uh, we had nine kids in the family. And uh, in particular, uh, my brother uh, Butch, who's a year older than me, and my brother Dan, who's a year younger than me, um, we would go to this place called Optimus Park. Um, Optimus Park, what a name. It was a, uh, a difficult place to go to because it was a dangerous place to go to. And uh, when we went to that park, uh, many times it was a place where uh, there would be uh, uh, different people, and they always seemed to be older than us, and they were always threatening to us. They were always uh, challenging us and always wanted to fight with us, and, and uh, many times they did that. So what we had to do, instead of being uh, discouraged or instead of being living in fear and not going to that park we would serve as outlooks besides playing baseball we would be sentries and we would be looking and keeping an eye on the path or on the alley where these gangs of people would come either they were older than us or they outnumbered us so we would always pick up our gloves and bats and balls and we would run and it's interesting that, that that really shaped a lot of our lives do you know that the city of Detroit absolutely neglected that park okay, for a couple years' time. And so my brother Butch, who was kind of the leader, he was the, older, the oldest one of us. He was a year older than me anyway. I have an older brother, Ty and Daryl, but, but Butch was a year older than me, so we kind of looked to him. He was always the leader and, and in many ways a, a very good problem solver. And he decided that what we need to do, since the city of Detroit was no longer mowing the lawn, that we weren't going to give up playing baseball. We were going to mow the lawns ourselves. So back in those days, we had a propeller mower. Do you remember those? We had a propeller mower. So uh, I think we had two people on the, on the team of a dozen uh, kids, 11, 12, and 13 years old, uh, that had a power mower, and that helped. 
but we would mow the lawn every week so that we could play baseball at that park. And we would serve as sentries to watch out for the gangs that would come or the people that wanted to do us harm. But none of that was going to stop us from playing a game that we so loved. It's interesting as I think back on that place called Optimus Park. It's not very optimistic about it at all. But it was the only baseball field that we had. And we loved to play baseball. So we weren't going to give that up. And we fought to keep that in our own way and to keep it up. And it's interesting how the name of that park, Optimus Park, made Optimus, I believe, out of every one of us. Learning to overcome challenges, learning, learning to overcome struggles and trials that would come our way. And it's that kind of attitude, I think, that was given to us from our parents and our great-grandparents and, and our grandparents of teaching us to overcome. And that's what the disciples are learning in this upper room. That's what the disciples do. You know, you talk about Doubting Thomas. Let me tell you what happened to those disciples. Doubting Thomas would go on to become an evangelist in the country of India. Peter and Paul would focus on Italy, which was a very populated country at that time. They would focus there on their evangelism efforts. Do you know that Andrew went as far as the Soviet Union today to, to do his evangelism efforts? And each and every one of them, Matthew went to Iran, modern-day Iran. They went as far away as Saudi Arabia. But they all took the word of God, and they were emboldened by the resurrection of Christ in knowing that this gospel is something that needs to be preached to the world, and that's what Jesus told them to do, and that's what we are called to do. Jesus says uh, today, as he says to the disciples in the upper room, blessed are you who believe even though you have not seen. This is living with the joy, an inexpressible sometimes joy, but a joy <coughs> that is filled with great expectation, always believing that the future is going to be better than today, always believing, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. That scripture rings true today, for we know God is with us, and God is seeing us through the valley of our time. We will overcome this. And we, too, will know the full, full force of the resurrection in our own lives when our time comes. We will be reunited. We will see God face to face and Jesus and all of our family members and all who believe. That is the sure and certain hope of the gospel. And that is the, the joy of faith that we live today. Amen. Good and gracious God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, all signs of your gracious love. Receive these gifts from the hands of your people. On behalf of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Now I invite you to join with me in this morning's prayers of the church. Uplifted by the promise, hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and in all places, praying for the church, for the world, and for all those in need. Open the doors, Lord, that we close. Guide us to unity and harmony, that we may come to respect and cherish our commonalities with others. Open the paths that we ignore, God, where when we patronize uh, financial gain and convenience over listening to the needs and the cries of those who are wanting. Inspire all to care for the world that you have made so that living things might thrive. Open the hearts, Lord, that we close. O oh God, to the cries of those in need. We pray for those isolated physically or emotionally through incarceration, addiction, mental illness, chronic suffering, grief, and those who are in need. Open the ways of love, O oh God, and the pursuit of peace throughout the world. 
and bless the efforts of our health care workers, of all of our first responders, of our missionaries, of our health care professionals, and those who are trying to find a cure for this coronavirus illness. We pray, God, for your presence and for your healing hand to be upon them. Open the way to us to eternal life, O oh God, and as we remember all of our family members and all of our friends who have died in faith. Free us, Lord, from the fear of death that we may embrace the peace that you have promised to all. Loving God, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to heal those who are ill. We ask you to come to our aid in the midst of the coronavirus crisis that we too may experience your healing love. We ask you to heal those who are sick, calm those who are living in fear, be with those who have died and comfort their families. Inspire our health care professionals and aid them in your healing work. Guide our national leaders to make decisions with wisdom and compassion. Bless our nurses and bless all of the people working in our hospital systems. Give them the peace that surpasses all understanding and fill them with sure and certain hope and confidence and joy. Help us, Lord, to always be aware of your presence as we place our trust in you. Amen. Father, you are holy indeed, and all creation rightly gives you praise. All life and all holiness comes from you through your, through your Son by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let our celebration this morning raise us up and renew our lives by the Spirit that is within us. In the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and poured it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to partake in this great supper. Lord, we are not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and we shall be healed. And now let us sum up our prayers in the words that Jesus taught us, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let us pray our post-communion prayer. Almighty God, you have provided for us the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, and that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forevermore. Amen. In the way of announcements this morning, I just wanted to extend a, a thank you to all of you. Um, I have received uh, different emails, and uh, we are following this service on YouTube, and we have many people from, gosh, all around the country that are tuning in uh, to watch our worship service here, and I pray that this will be a blessing uh, uh, to all who watch it. Um, I'm thankful for uh, the uh, method that we have of YouTube, and I got to say, uh, you know, again, uh, I owe a great debt of thanks and gratitude to my brother Dan. He was the one who had the idea to uh, uh, have the church wired and to buy the different cameras and the things that we are doing. It took us almost a year to have this done, but boy, who would have thought that we would have needed it to actually uh, have worship for all of you. So again, I, I'm very thankful for Dan and his ability to have foresight. Uh, 
to see uh, the things of making our church stronger and better and help us to communicate uh, with more people. And that's what it's all about, folks. So I thank you all for supporting our church in, in every way, financially and through prayer. Um, I look forward to the day when we'll be worshiping together, and that day is coming soon. Until then, I leave you with the benediction that Moses gave to the people in the wilderness. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this broken when all is dark, you help us see There is only one salvation We believe We believe We believe in God the Father We believe Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptations Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit.